Hi guys and girls, so today we're going to be looking at mental health and we're just sort of giving a general introduction. It does go for a little long, sorry. Alright, so here's the key knowledge, you can look at it yourself. Mental health. So the World Health Organization, otherwise known as WHO, which you should probably know considering that it does come up occasionally, um, views mental health as a state of well-being in which an individual realises his, his or her own capacity abilities and can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and is able to make a contribution uh, to his or her community. So what you should really be looking at here is the fact that they know what they can, can and cannot do, they can cope with the normal stresses of life, they can work productively and they can make contributions to uh, their community. Uh, they can make the most of their potential, they can cope with challenges for everyday life and play a full part in their family, school, workplace, community and when among friends. Mental health is just as important as physical health. You need to actually have a combination of the two, despite what all your personal trainers are saying. Our mental health can also change over time, so different circumstances are going to rely on different mental health uh, capabilities, so it changes as we get older. Mental health is often presented on a continuum, and I would recommend um, including that in continuum in your results. Oh, sorry, in your notes. So if you happen to be uh, mentally healthy, you're able to cope with everything, right? You just can cope with the stresses, you're mentally healthy. But you're not necessarily going to be at this point. You might be here, or you might be here. Maybe you're having a bad day, or a bad couple of days, and you're closer to here, right? Maybe you're experiencing the stress from COVID or the exams or a sack. You might be around this point here. If it doesn't recover as quickly as what you normally would, you might be around this side. As it gets worse and worse and worse, um, you might start heading down this direction and you might notice that you're not having as um, many good days as you are having bad and this is when it starts to get to a mental health disorder so there's no clear-cut spot where you should be on that continuum and that's why it's measured or presented as a continuum you won't necessarily everyone who's mentally healthy will be along this line it'll be along this line somewhere um, so mentally healthy means being in a generally positive state of mental well-being having the ability to cope and manage with life challenges. You can work productively, you can strive to fulfill one, your own goals and potential, and you have a sense of connection to others and the community in general. So you're generally healthy, right? You're happy, you can work, you can do things that you wanna do, you strive to achieve goals, and you wanna connect with others. You start having a mentally mental health problems so around this section here when it starts to what stresses and things that are going on start to affect the way you think you feel the way you behave but it's to a lesser extent and shorter duration than a mental disorder so you might be you know very anxious you might be irritable you can't concentrate um, reduced motivation social withdrawal and a lot of people right now are saying oh I've got a mental disorder um, to do with COVID, it's not necessarily a mental disorder at this point. If it's consistent, then yes, of course it is. But if you're every now and again, it's normal to have that sort of thoughts and feelings and things like that. So you might be along this side to a mental health problem, but if it continues, it might get worse, right? At some point in your life, everyone's going to have a mental health problem. You're going to have your good days. You're going to have your bad days. You're going to have good days, good weeks, good months, and then good and bad weeks, months. So a mental disorder is at this end of the continuum, right? So it's not just there. It's along this part. So a mental disorder is also called a mental illness. And it is a mental health state that involves a combination of thoughts, feelings and behaviours which are usually associated with significant personal distress and impair the ability to function with everyday life. And I just want to point out uh, this bit here. So it affects the ability to function in everyday life. And that didn't work. So let's have a look at that. So ability to function effectively in everyday life. Right? 
they keep putting that in because it's important for you to know. That word impairs the ability to function. I, they really want you to remember that. And a lot of the definitions associated with mental health, with stress, um, with sleep disorders, do have that final line there. So when you're writing an answer about a mental disorder, you may want to include that particular section. All right, so the essential characteristics of a mental disorder are occurs within the individual and results in dysfunction within the individual. There's clinically diagnosable dysfunction in thoughts, feelings, and beha in behaviour. So your symptoms are, they can be diagnosed. You can actually go to a doctor and they would say, are you experiencing this, 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 and this? Therefore, you have this, right? So it can be diagnosed. It caused significant personal distress or disability in everyday functioning. So once again, going back to this one, Typic actions and reactions are atypical. So they're not normal for you. So let's say, for example, you happen to be, uh, you got a bad SAC score. And normal reactions would be to, you know, get upset about it. That's normal. However, if you happen to have no, um, you know, response whatsoever, that's atypical. Maybe you've won the lottery and you go, I don't care. That's bad. Alrighty. So the disorder is not a result of personal conflict. It's not because you're having, um, you know, one particular moment and you're having a bad day or something like that. It has to be a combination of different things. So I do recommend putting this um, into your notes. So they're the different categories of disorders. I'll let you go through that on your own, um, but it is good to know. So you may want to pause it here and have a look. So just to sum up this section, mental health is measured on a continuum. This continuum ranges from mentally healthy, mental health problem and mental disorder or mental illness. Well, mentally healthy means being generally positive state of mental well-being, having the ability to cope and manage life's challenges, working productively, striving to fulfill one's goals and potential, and having a sense of connection to others in the community, having a mental health problem suggests that you would have difficulties with those. But they're not going to be as severe as what they would be if you had a mental health disorder. So if you had a mental health disorder or a mental disorder, mental illness, you wouldn't be able to work productively. You wouldn't be able to strive to fulfill your goals. You wouldn't have a connection to others. In fact, you might have the exact opposite. Normally, you'd be very much up for hanging out with friends, but um, with a mental disorder, you perhaps wouldn't. So when you're looking at a mental disorder um, or mental health, actually, in general, you're looking at it from internal and external factors. So internal factors are within the person and they are the biological, which is these ones here. And you may want to put this into your notes because it's a very good um, example or diagram. So these are the biological factors that affect mental health. These are the psychological factors that look at mental health. And we'll be mainly looking at the psychological factors in the remainder of this PowerPoint. The external factors are the factors that um, originate outside the person. And this can include school, work, relationships, support, education, pretty much everything that is not within you. And this is known as the biopsychosocial model. And you may remember the, this from the stress unit that we did. Um, so this model is describing uh, a way of describing and explaining how biological, psychological and social factors combine and interact to influence a person's mental health. It is based on the idea that mental health is best understood by considering specific factors within each domain and how these may combine and interact to influence our well-being. It reflects a holistic view of mental health. So you're not just looking at the biological or the psychological. You're looking at everything in combination, right? It's both internal and external factors. Vika really like you to look at it from the biological, biopsychosocial model. So take the holistic approach. And they really love that word, holistic. So you're considering everything and how they interact and combine with one another. So, a person who is mentally healthy tends to have a high level of functioning, right? So they can operate um, in their environment and they can work independently. 
Um, they have good interpersonal relationships. They can interact with others. Um, the school and work settings, they achieve goals. They set goals for themselves and go, all right, I want to get a 75% on my next sack. They set that goal and they work towards it. Leisure and recreational activities, they actually do these activities. They engage in sport. Okay, granted right now it's not possible, but still. Um, you may take up drawing. Daily living skills, independent living. There are some, and it's, it's quite sad, but in some cases people who are, have mental health problems struggle to do day-to-day -day activities. So normally they might you know, have a clean room, they might clean the dishes and do all that sort of stuff. But when you're depressed or you have a mental health problem, there is a, or mental disorder, there is a good chance that things that you would normally do to maintain your personal um, daily living skills, such as, you know, having showers, getting dressed, you know, brushing your teeth, all that sort of stuff, tends to be the last thing you think about. It's more about, you know, I don't want to do it. I, I just don't have the energy. And it gets quite um, problematic when this happens again and again and again. And it becomes a cyclical thing, right? Because you're not changing, you're not making the bed, you're not doing all these sort of things, you start dwelling on it and go, oh, God, I'm such a slob. Um, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And that makes you more depressed. Think about it this way. When you're depressed or when you have a mental disorder, you may eat more, which then you start putting on weight, which means that you then start to go, oh, I'm putting on weight. I'm so sad. I'm so depressed. I'm just going to eat more. And then you just keep doing it. So it's this never-ending cycle. Cognitive skills, your learning, planning and decision making tends to be good. So you have a high level of functioning, but in a mental health disorder, you tend not to. Emotions, you can regulate your emotions. If you have a mental health problem or a mental disorder, you may struggle to actually cope with everyday emotions. And you may get upset about things that you normally wouldn't get upset about. So mentally healthy people typically have high level of functioning. The... People who don't tend to have a mental health problem or a mental disorder. It also means that they are pr they're pretty much adaptive. So if something happens, they can adapt to the situation, which is where I'm going to now. Uh, so they can effectively carry out their everyday tasks and can adapt to demands of daily living. So if something comes up, they can work around it. Maladaptive behaviour interferes with the person's ability to carry out their usual activities in an effective way. Right? So maladaptive behaviour is sometimes called dysfunctional behaviour because it disrupts or impairs everyday functioning. So it's commonly associated with low level of functioning. You can't adapt. You can't, when something comes up, you struggle to adapt to this new situation. And see this one here? Um, this little table, it's a little bit different from the other one. It's got high, moderate, low. This is the level of functioning, right? So if you've got a moderate level of functioning, you might have a mental health problem. If you have a low, you might have a mental disorder. Hope that makes sense. All right. High levels of social and emotional well-being. So if you're mentally healthy, there is a good chance that um, how you feel about yourselves and your lives are going to be generally positive. Right? And your social well-being means that you can have, you know, good relationships with others and interact with other people, right? And you're more likely to have a high level of social well-being if you're mentally healthy. And you can develop and maintain relationships. You can interact with others. You respect and understand others. You resolve conflicts, manage unhealthy relationships, spend time with loved ones and feel self-confident. So you wouldn't have that high level of social well-being if you are from the, you know, having a mental health problem or a mental disorder. For emotional well-being, it's based on the ability to control emotions and express them appropriately and comfortably. This means that you can share your emotions and you can understand other people's emotions. Uh, a person with high level of emotional well-being is likely to develop awareness about themselves and others. 
regulate, express, and identify emotions so they know why they're sad. They have a positive attitude about emotions. They go, okay, so yes, I'm a bit sad today, but tomorrow I'll be better. Right, so they have a positive attitude, not always dwelling on the bad stuff. Um, they can see the thoughts and behaviours of others. They accept mistakes. They make decisions with little worry. Um, they effectively manage their stress. And they live and work independently and they take responsibility for their actions. So resilience is another one. And this is something that VCAR go crazy over. Right, so I, I'm just going to underline that. Hopefully it's in red. It is. Resilience. You get that and you go nuts with it. Resilience is very important, right? And this is what we're finding these days uh, a lot of kids are struggling with because we've been helping them so much. You haven't developed that resilience that you need. Good thing is COVID is going to help you with that resilience. Yay for COVID on that one. We've got to take a little win, people. So having good mental health does not mean that we don't go through bad times or fail to experience disappointment or sadness. Right? There's always going to be a time where you didn't get what you want, where you didn't win that million dollars every Thursday. So sad. Anyway, mental health is linked to our resistance to adversity and how well we cope with life stresses. So we're actually measuring how well you actually overcome those stresses. And that's called resilience. So it's your ability to cope with and adapt well to life stresses and restore positive functioning. So right now, with this COVID thing going on, how well are you adapting to it? How well are you adapting to the different schooling, right? How can you go, all right, so this is a bad situation, but how can I see the positives to it? And resilience is very important. And this is something that we should be teaching from primary school, if not earlier. We should be teaching resilience, right? And we need to be teaching you how to bounce back from adversity. And you'll see a lot of articles out there that talk about the importance of, uh, you know, letting kids fail because it allows you to learn how to actually cope with failure. Although I think we need to reword some of those. But anyway, moving on. Uh, some people have more or less resilience. People who are mentally healthy are commonly described as resilient, whereas people who are mentally unwell tend to have a low level of resilience. All right? So if you have a mental disorder, you tend to actually just dwell on the negative. All right? It's unfortunate. I know, I know. All right? But you, you'll struggle to actually go... All right, so what next? All right, yes, I have. I've been having a bad time of it lately, but you just dwell on it. You don't actually look to how to improve or how to um, overcome that or see something from a different point of view. And I think we need to work on that. So resilience to life stresses. So characteristics enabling someone to bounce back from life stressor include a strong belief in abilities, right? High self-esteem approaching stress with a sense of optimism, right? So that might be that you go, okay, this is stressful right now, but on Friday, I'm going to, you know, just tune out and I'm going to have some fun with my friends. Go on a Zoom call. Zoom is all right, by the way. Uh, being adaptable and flexible. So if something bad comes up, you don't go, okay, it's over, I can't do this. You find a different way of doing it. If your plans don't work out, you go with something else. I remember going overseas and, you know, my plans changed mid-flight. So I had to plan on the go. So if you're adaptable and flexible, you're more likely to have it. And you can learn these things. Being organised is strongly recommended. Um, you'll never... If you're organised and you go, all right, so this is what I plan to do, but have a backup as well, then you are going to have a better, um, a higher resilience than other people. And this is something that I strongly encourage. Have a list. Do what you need to do. Um, having problem solving skills, good social support systems is always good. So counting on your friends and family and caring and supportive relationships is also good. And this helps you 
to bounce back from a stressor or something bad. And that's why there's a lot of encouragement at the moment for people to, you know, reach out to their friends and family during this very difficult time. Now, this last one is something that I've put in there about ethics. And there's only really two that you need to worry about when it comes to the mental health research. Informed consent and um, placebos. So with informed consent, you pretty much know what it is. Um, most times people can volunteer and get um, cons oh, give consent based on, you know, what they've heard about the research, what they've learnt. But you have to be able to understand the purpose of research. And some people with mental disorders just can't provide informed consent. And that's because they don't have the mental capacity to do so. So if you're going to get informed consent in mental health research, you have to get consent when they are, um, they've got the full mental capacity to do so. So let's say, for example, there are some days where they're having a really good day. And that's when you have to get informed consent. If they are unable to give consent, and we're actually looking at mental health studies, right? It can be given by a legal guardian or authorised by law. However, uh, most research would prefer that it's the individual giving consent and they know what it is. Um, placebo treatments is the other one. And for those people who have forgotten what placebos are, they are a neutral or they are a fake treatment um, and has no effect. Uh, and it's pretty much used in medical trials to determine the effectiveness of the actual drug. So you'd compare the placebo, which has should have no results, right? And compare it to people who have actually taken the drug. So exposure to a placebo can be problematic if you have a mental illness. So let's say, for example, I happen to take an antidepressant, right? And I've been taking them for months. And then all of a sudden, I go into this research trial that looks at a different antidepressant. But unbeknownst to me, I get put into the placebo group or the control group. And this means that I'm no longer receiving treatment, right? And because I'm no longer receiving treatment, for depression, there is a good chance that not receiving that treatment could lead to negative side effects and me getting very, very sick and me getting uh, very, very depressed and suicidal sort of deal. So having a placebo is quite problematic because it could change um, the well-being of the individual if they receive no actual treatment. So you're denying treatment to somebody who actually needs it. Placebos, not too cool with that. So um, it does involve deception and it can, especially someone with mental disorder, sometimes involving or giving, using deception actually can mean that they're going to struggle to cope with everyday functioning, right? So just imagine being lied to from your doctor. Yeah, not good. Either way, to sum up, mental health is examined in a holistic way. Remember that word. In, and it's through internal factors, so within the individual, biological and psychological, external factors, so outside the individual, such as social, social and this is known as the biopsychosocial model. People who are mentally healthy usually are high, ha, usually have a high level of functioning, high social and emotional well-being, and high resilience. Um, there are ethical concerns associated with mental illness research. So giving a placebo to someone with a mental disorder would mean that they are not receiving treatment and could get worse. And some people with mental disorder are unable to give informed consent as they do not have the mental capacity to give consent. So this is the work exam question for today. Identify one characteristic of good mental health that the psychologist might be looking for in the potential astronauts and how this characteristic may be observed in their behaviour during the interview process. And this is worth two marks. Now there is a section before it, but we're ignoring it for this particular task. So because we know that it's two marks, we need to know where those two marks are. For the first bit, it says identify one characteristic. So you know that this is going to be one mark here 
and then it says how this characteristic might be observed. This would be your second mark. If they say the word identify, they're not asking you to describe or explain or define. They're asking you to just state it. What is the one characteristic of good mental health or what is one of them? And then it's asking how it might be observed. So how would you ob observe that one characteristic? And there's your two marks. If you ever see a number, so if it says identify two, identify three, or if it says characteristics, so it's plural, highlight and underline that S because it means that there's more than one, obviously. All right, so the first mark, identification of one typical characteristic of a mentally healthy person that is relevant to the role of an astronaut, which may have been included, high level of functioning, social well-being, emotional well-being, resilience, ability to form social, positive social relationships, good quality sleep, physical abilities, good self-efficacy, absence of distress, dysfunction, and or deviant behavior. These last couple come in later um, in the PowerPoints, but these ones at least you know. All right, you need to also have a valid and congruent uh, description of how a psychologist may observe this characteristic in an interview. So you may observe the relevant characteristic during an interview. You may notice that they are, um, they can actually form a good positive relationship with you, right? Um, they are very capable, so they have good self-efficacy. Uh, they seem to be, have good emotional well-being, so they're not as stressed. It could be that um, they can answer direct questions about how the above character, about any of the characteristics. So, can you tell me a time when you happened to experience um, some stress in your life and how did you cope with it? And this is why we tend to ask, and I think a lot of interviewers these days or in the coming years are going to ask, so how did you cope with COVID? That will be a question that will be on a lot of people's um, applications, I think. Anyway, or it could be appropriate answers related to the characteristic on a psychological test. So they might do a test. So you're essentially just looking at these three. You'd state one of these and then say um, how it might be observed. So you might say observing the relevant characteristic during an interview, for example. And 